For the grace of Christ, brethren, we'll continue our lesson from the Old Testament, from the book of Genesis. We'll read from chapter 15. Chapter 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the hair of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring, and did one born in my house is my hair. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your hair, but one who will come from your own body shall be your hair. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? So he said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, and turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought all these things to him and cut them in two down to the middle and placed each piece opposite the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them four hundred years. And also the nation whom they serve I will judge. Afterward they shall come out with great possessions. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark, that behold, there was a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. On the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, and the Kedmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, and the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. Amen. Almost two years have passed since Abraham went out from the Ur of the Chaldeans and um, Lot who was with him, he, they were separated in a way that wasn't pleased to God, yet Abraham, who was a man of God, stood faithful to God and righteous before a man. And these are the two characteristics that God cares to see in people, to find in people, and also if these two are not um, completed, uh, then there is iniquity, that is everything that is iniquity before God is sin, every iniquity is sin, says the word of God, and, and, and when you wrong someone, then this is sin as well. So Abram, had a characteristic of righteousness before man, and indeed before Lot, who wronged him, obviously. And uh, having a um, mindset of righteousness in his conscious, consciousness before God. When he delivered Lot from being captive from the nations, then the Amorites suggested that he would keep all the spoil all the spoils and give them the man, yet he took 
a stance of righteousness before God and man by saying that I want nothing from you. I want no benefit from sin. I want no benefit from doing wrong. It is very important, my beloved brethren, that in our life, in our daily life, may rule. We have no benefit from any transgression before God and we have no benefit from doing wrong before people. And this uh, conduct of man makes him to please God. And I repeat this, that we do not want any benefit from any iniquity and transgression and no benefit of any kind of form, not just material, but we want no benefit that comes for, from um, unrighteousness, from committing unrighteousness or from um, wicked people. But Abram did also something very nice. We would say that when out of the blue came before him Melchizedek, the king and priest of the Most High, then Abraham acted before him with humility and godliness. He gave him a tithe um, of all his, of his possessions as an honor, as the gospel of Jesus Christ exhorts us to honor the others, to honor them with a double um, honor, those who labor in the work of God. So he honored him by giving him uh, tithes, and Melchizedek blessed him as a king of righteousness, as a uh, king of peace and a priest before God. Now, all this uh, conduct of Abraham there in the land of Canaan, uh, God was absent and he was observing. And this is also very important for us to understand that whatever we do, God observes it. He might not intervene. And, um, he might not intervene by um, praising us or rebuking us, but yet he observes us completely. And to God belongs to... Uh, look upon the sons of man as the word of God says. You cannot escape from the eyes of the Lord. You can't do something hidden, something in secret, and you cannot even say or even think. God is the one who searches the hearts and minds. He knows completely the heart of man, what he desires, and the mind of the Lord. And of course, he knows his, uh, his holiness. And so when everything ended, and I would dare to say that Abraham, through all these trials that he went through, because these were trials, it was a trial that Lot was separated from him, it was a trial that Lot was um, taken captive and immediately he had to go and deliver him, and he did so. And it was a trial when he was found before Melchizedek, and it was a trial when uh, the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah offered him um, money abundantly, which someone would dare to say uh, that they belonged to him because he delivered all the captive people and all the spoils that I had taken from Sodom and Gomorrah, which were cities of uh, complete sin, of adultery, of fornication. Of... It was a trial, um, this thing, that he denied it, all of these things. So when he went all through these trials that came um, before him, and he stood in the best possible way, then God visits him. And God visits him and gives him two unique promises that I will be your defender. Fear nothing from now and on. Because as a man, I, I'm saying this, it's not the Bible, but um, I suppose that he had in his heart a uh, fear. Now, what will the nations do when they will gather together? Uh, the nations that I have destroyed and taken, and I've taken the spoils from them. And our God comes 
and all the fears which she possibly have because all people have uh, some kind of fears in the situations in their lives but when God comes and tells you that I am your defender then everything vanishes if God defends you then you have nothing to fear the Apostle Paul says that if God is with us then who can be against us so our main goal and I would dare to to uh, say our ambition is that God may be with us and God is with us when we are with God God d does not look with partiality toward people he is graceful to each one of us that is he doesn't pay off to us according to what we're worth or he gives us things that we're not worthy of it But he doesn't do things because you're good or this or that. God doesn't uh, act in this way. Uh, he doesn't also praise. He doesn't act in a... Uh, but yet the word of God is yes and amen. And I insist that our ambition should be... It should be always that God may be with us. And God most definitely would be with us if we are with God. And when God goes away, even if we're trying to be with him, the main reason that God departs from a man, besides um, of sin and, and transgression and iniquity, but because of a man that, uh, who is striving, uh, the reason is because of pride. And pride is something that a man cannot comprehend when this thing happens. You can easily uh, become haughty and understand nothing of what is happening yet um, praise be to God there are symptoms which when we see them in our life then with all definitely we can understand that this pride of us has gone um, a long way because um, I was expecting a different um, response I was waiting that you would honor me more yet the word of God says that you should forgive the humble man no matter what another man will do to him he says that he didn't understand it doesn't matter and if he hasn't understood what he has done then may God will bless him I've done uh, many things this is the one kind of attitude this is humility yet when someone is haughty says why did he tell me to do th uh, th did he tell me to do this and to that this is the beginning of pride and what follows is that bitterness comes into the heart after complaint and bitterness comes, I become bitter because um, things are not as I, um, as I want to be and he doesn't treat to me in the right way. But in no case when um, you cannot have bitterness and complaint, the Christian man is always forgiving his long suffering and he always forgets and, and he always thinks in a good way. Bitterness is an adv advanced uh, for more pride and the third thing is when someone becomes angry I become angry I, I gnash my teeth and I be and I uh, shout and this comes only from pride and this phenomenon is a great um, sign of pride when a man becomes angry and anyway if he doesn't repent right away in, in one second because this might happen also but he who is a believer and is humble then right away he corrects himself right away he humbles himself right away he forgives and right away he is long suffering but if this anger complain and then bitterness and uh, the anger and hatred uh, the the uh, the strife if the these things are in the heart of man then this man is and complete pride and as a result of this God is not with him and if God is not with him then he he he's the he doesn't have someone to defend him to protect him and someone to take care of him so Abram as he was uh, called in the beginning with all this contact he, uh, 
it was evident that not only he was righteous before um, God and people, that, but that he was humble. He didn't complain about Lot. He didn't become bitter because of Lot. He didn't become angry. Though he had many reasons to do so and to act in this way. And so God visited him and he told him that I am your defender. And to tell you the truth, we all want this. Isn't it so, brethren? I want very much um, this, that God may come and tell, me, uh, and tell me that he's my defender. And he will be our defender, my defender when I'll be with him. God will be with me. Also, uh, another thing about pride is that sometimes we are glad about the things that we are doing. This is the beginning of pride. We achieve to make, uh, to, to succeed, for example, at work. We achieve uh, a success, a victory in spiritual things. We don't fall in sin, for example. And at that moment, our heart, I'm saying this from experience, we're saying, I've made it. Then you're done. When you thought about it and before you said so, you should say, the Lord, you made it because a Christian man gives glory and praise only to God. Everything that you have achieved to this point, it's not you that have done it. Um, I've won. No, Lord, you have won. Always, every, everything that is good that we have done, even if in our heart and mind it will come for us to praise ourselves, then right away we'll correct it before it even comes out from our mouth. We'll correct it in our heart and we'll say, Lord, you have done this. Everything good that you might have, either if it's old, new, or even um, much old, right away it shall come out from my mouth the praise toward the Lord. Because otherwise we steal. Because God made it. Was it I that I made it? God won. God helped me. God did it. I did nothing. God did it. But when you say so, and then right away your heart... Um, um, gets a lower and you come to a state that pleases God and you find your way. And then you make sure for yourself to be defended by God because you are with God. And I repeat it that we are not with God when we fall and to sin in a permanent sin that we do not repent and, and if we even repent then we continue in sin then we um, Sin, commit sin continually, uh, willingly. And the second thing, which is the most important, is pride. So the Lord, to Abram, who didn't commit sin and his conduct was righteous before God and righteous also before people, and he didn't um, claim his uh, righteousness but he gave everything to Lot and even to the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah according to the word of the Lord and for the um, glory of God the Father and for this reason God tells him do not be afraid from now on I will be your defender and the second thing also is very important your reward shall be exceedingly great do you know what it means that God may give us a reward because we all receive a reward from our bosses, from work, from our customers. We, we gain something. But do you know what it means God to give you a reward in material and spiritual things? Why? Because he didn't claim anything from, from himself. On the contrary, he gave tithes to the king and priest of Melchizedek. These two characteristics um, um, brought this wonderful promises to Abraham that I will be your defender and your reward will be exceedingly great. And indeed, Abraham became um, exceedingly rich. Of course, from... Uh, afterwards, what we'll come to realize is that Abram will, will have nothing. Will have nothing to do. They, they won't be related. And when God will decide to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, Abram 
has lot in his heart and he's asking God will you destroy the righteous with the uh, wicked there weren't any righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah the only righteous people were Lot his wife and his relatives and when I'm saying his relatives it's his uh, servants that what Abraham thought and that's why he ended up to ask about ten people he always had him in his mind yet they were separated and here my dear brethren what I'm saying is very serious when two people are separated then what kind of contact will they have at some point um, Barnabas and Paul they were separated you remember this they were aggravated and Paul said I will go this way and Barnabas the other way yet Paul never stopped l loving Barnabas neither Barnabas Paul they just took a different mission from the Lord and they completed and they always loved and they were um, and they ended up in heaven but here we don't see Lot ever again to think about Abram he doesn't show gratitude to him that um, because he delivered him so he was completely separated from him their paths were separated this is very serious um, when two people take a different path and when this happens then God sees what you are thinking about the one whom you do not see because they might um, um, be separated because one goes to another part of the country because they change work but what matters is what they are thinking of Abram always had Lord in his heart and he took care of him yet Lord never again did he thought about Abram now let us continue when Abram heard these good promises he had to be exceedingly glad but he wasn't because he had a pain in his soul he had a disappointment remember that he had promised him that I will give you a seed and through your seed the nations shall be blessed and he was 76 78 years old so, um, around there and nothing had happened yet and when God promises something then um, the man is in a hurry uh, God told me so and then he will do it and sometimes he doesn't think um, when he will do it and um, much more how he will do it that means in what kind of situation God will bring me so that he, he will bring to pass what he has promised me and the second thing is when will God be able to to bring me or when will be the time for God to do it so Abram was very disappointed and bittered to this great promises uh, promises which we admire God um, passed them and he considered them small in regard to the pain that he has in, her, in his heart and many times this pain is uh, great is big and most of the time this pain that we have in our hearts it's not according to the will of God so the, the pain that he has is Lord you have forgotten me no God never forgets us on the contrary the only one who truly remembers us is God for us today in the New Testament is Christ he hasn't forgotten you if you have pain in your heart he hasn't forgotten you he has to do what is perfect like Zechariah and Elizabeth Lord you have gotten us we were praying to give us a child but we grew old and nothing happened yet God had prepared John for them and always brethren when we think that God forgets us we should believe and we should know that God has something much better to give us when something doesn't happen as we want it to happen we are not like other people who became um, disappointed but instead we say thank you Lord because we know that you have something better and this is not the comfort to the one who is sick till his soul come out but this is a truth God doesn't give you this thing 
because he has in your mind something much better to give you. And if you receive this thing, then um, he won't be able to give you what he has in his mind. This is the mercy of God. Do you believe that God is love? We have to start from there. Do you believe that God loves you? And if he even doesn't give you something, does this mean that his love became less? No. But his love continues to be um, great for you and he has prepared something much better for you. And for this reason, praise God. Let us not forget to praise God, to thank God. Not, uh, not do this by habit, but um, we should say, Praise unto you, Lord. Glory unto you, Christ. And we should praise Him for the things that He has done for us, but even more for the things that He intends to do. Because God confirms to us that He has good counsels for us. Yet one is the problem. When the Lord will come to give you His promises, will you find faith in you or will you have lost your faith? If you have lost your faith, then he'll come, but he won't find you and your place. It is as if I'm waiting for Anna to come and have a supper. And when I see that she's late, um, uh, I'm thinking, I'll have a supper on my own. And then Anna comes and she brings a great uh, supper. So I've lost the, the roasted lamb because Anna was late, because she went to buy, to prepare it. And this thing has happened. And when she came, then I have had eaten um, the beans. I have filled my heart with beans because I was impatient. For this reason, brethren, if I trust that Anna loves me, then will we not trust God that he loves us? What will we say? Now, Abram, in the end, he will do so. Will I do something because I don't know what God will do? So he brings out his... Um, bitterness, his disappointment and his sorrow. God has good counsels for you who have pain and bitterness in your heart and I um, confirm to you that this is the word of God. Yet be a little bit patient. Wait. We need to be patient in order to do the will of God and then we will enjoy the promises of God. So when he told him these wonderful words, um, how much I would love that the Lord will come and tell us um, these words, that I'm your defender, that your reward will be exceedingly great. And do you know what Abraham says? Lord God, what will you give to me? I'm um, going away without a child. I'm 77, 78 years old, single go childless, and the hair of my house is... Um, Eliezer of Damascus. Then Abraham said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. The righteous and faithful Abraham, I would dare to say that he was wrong here. He made a mistake. You didn't give me a seed. Yes, I didn't. I haven't given you a seed yet. Will he not give you? Is God a liar? Will he not complete his uh, promise since he told you, well done, good um, and, and save, uh, good servant? Yet this is a human weakness which God accepts because he knows that we are weak men, wretched, that we are nothing. And he recognizes this and now he will help him that he may not lose his faith and become desperate. And behold, the word of the Lord came to his saying, This one shall not be your heir, Eliezer, but one who will come from your own body. He shall be your heir. Then he was strengthened. And it says that he brought him outside. Do you understand what kind of relationship they had? God was in the tent and he was speaking to him. God will speak to you into your house, into your um, chamber of prayer. So he went to his tent and said, Now let us go out, outside. And it was night and he, and he showed him heaven. He said, Look now toward heaven. Can you count the stars? And Abram looked and he couldn't count them. And he said, So shall your descendants be. 
And the Bible says that not only he strengthened him and comforted him, but Abraham believed. And from that moment that he believed in the word of God, though he was not righteous, God counted him. This was counted to him for righteousness. And then after that, he called him Abram the righteous. And God continues and says that he will give him more things. And then he said to him, when he saw him that he believed, if he hadn't believed, then he wouldn't uh, continue. If you don't believe, then you don't have a future. I believe. And God continues to speak to me, to, prom to uh, promise to me. If I stop to believe in God, then God stops also. Do you want God to stop, to think about you, to promise to you and speak to you? Then lay unbelief in your heart. And how does unbelief come? Can unbelief come in my heart? Yes, yeah, certainly this can happen. This comes from a small doubt. When you let in your heart a small doubt, perhaps this is not so. And how does faith come? How does faith increase? It, it comes from small assurance. Perhaps I should try God. Perhaps he will answer me. So when you start by saying, should I try God? Is God with me? Then God he will visit you and he will increase your faith. But when you say, is it that perhaps he's not, perhaps this won't happen, this thing, this thing brings unbelief. We should be careful with our thoughts from our thoughts because from the abundance of heart speaks the mouth from our thoughts comes come out our words and from our thoughts and words come our deeds so my heart speaks and I speak and when I speak my heart speaks and then we are destroyed when my heart speaks then I stop her no you're not right God loves me amen that's from where we'll start when doubt comes, then God is love. God is my Father. Have you understood this, my heart? And what is, does the Word of God say? That if our heart does not condemn us, and God is greater from our heart, and He brings quietness and peace. This happens when I have thoughts of faith. If our heart does not condemn us, then we have boldness toward God, and everything that we ask from God, He gives us. So we have a fight against our heart, a serious fight to take because our heart is desperate and exceedingly wicked. And how will I confront my heart? I will do this with the mind of Christ. For this reason, Christ has given us the mind of Christ. Um, God has given us the Christ of mind so that I may search my thoughts, my words, my environment, everything that happens. And we'll do this with the mind, mind of Christ so that I may um, achieve what God wants. And now God continues and says to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. Do you remember what he had said? He had said to Abraham in the beginning, go out from your land and from your relatives and from the house of your father and go to the land that I will show you. You have to trust me. You have to follow me and that I may take you to this land. I was found from Haran and there to Canaan. Is this a land or not? And he promised him um, many other things that I will make a great nation. So now he comes to t tell him which is the land and he tells him that I have brought you from the Ur of the Chaldeans. Have you understood this? So that I may give you this land to inherit, the land of Canaan, which is not one meter. It's a, a, a complete huge area, which is water from Jordan, who is uh, by the seaside, who has good um, soil and has deserts also. I will give you this land. And this was a lot of land for Abram. 
all this land of Canaan? It is as if uh, he'll tell you, he, you ask of him a child and he'll give you ten. Ten? Give me, Lord, a job and he, make, he makes you a manager. All this land, I will give it to you. It's yours. Do you know what it means to inherit it? It's mine and I'm giving it to you. And Abraham lost it. All this land will be my, will I inherit it? Since there are uh, Amorites, Canaanites, um, Perizzites, will you give me all this land? If you give me, um, you say that you'll give me a seed that will become great, I believe it to you. But to give me all this land, this is very big to believe it. Has this happened to you? God, to give you a promise and you to, to be amazed? As Moses said, why don't you go and find someone else? That's what Abraham said. Me? Have you called me? Will you give me all this land? This thought was seemed to be great to Abram. And he said, Now how will I be sure that I will inherit this land? Now God has to assure him uh, for this. And he makes a covenant to Abram. He gives him um, an inheritance with a covenant. And he said, Come that I may tell you something. And you know, brethren, what God did... With Abraham, this was known to people back at that time. And if you want us to see it, let us go to the book of Jeremiah. And I will give the people who did not keep my covenant, who did not do the words of my covenant, which I did, the covenant which they did before me, when they tore the calf, the rulers of Judah and the rulers of Jerusalem, the eunuchs and the priests and all the people of this land, which have passed through these sacrifices. Now, what did they do? They made a covenant with God. How? They made it uh, with a sacrifice. They used to tear the, the calf. They used to pass through, through this. And this was a promise. And afterwards, this was a burning sacrifice. And this is something that God has taught first. And look what he's done. And he said to him, And he said to him, Bring me a heifer that is three years old, and a goat that is three years old, and a ram three years old, and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. Receive this for me. It won't be yours. These are mine. Then he received for himself all these things and he cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other but he did not cut the birds in two. So he prepared the place that God was about to make a covenant with a sacrifice. And the great agreement that God did with this sacrifice with, with, with uh, Christ on the cross of Golgotha when God made the great covenant uh, with the sacrifice of Christ, who became the calf, the slaughtered uh, lamb, which was sacrificed, and God passed um, from, from, the, from the midst. This was done in the morning. And he continues. And then the vultures came down on the carcasses and Abram drove them away. 
now the responsibility to keep this intention of God, God has given it to Abram. Now be careful. The things that I'm offering um, in our covenant, be careful lest the vultures will eat them. And he protected them through the whole day till the evening. He did nothing else than to protect um, what God was about to do from the vultures. He did nothing else than protect from the vultures what God has pr had promised to do. And this happens to us also. God has promised um, to us and he will do it yet the devil is trying to destroy it it's what we said in the beginning what is the devil trying to do he sends the vultures the demons the the thoughts to make the man to lose the promise of God and for this reason I'm saying that God has good counsels it's not I who is saying this. It's the word of God. God has good counsels for you. Yet do not let the vultures, the thoughts, and the devil, and the attacks of the devil to destroy you, the promises of God in your soul, in your heart, in your life. Now, this is a fight you have to, to take. When the vultures so... A dead flesh, they, they tried to fall on it, to attack it. But Abram, till late at night, he, he protected them. So He protected the sacrifice, the promise of God and the work of God. Now, when the sun was going down, now remember, he showed him the stars it became morning and morning came till the the going down of the sun he didn't know when God will intervene he didn't know when God will bless his sacrifice the sacrifice that he asked for himself but he knew that God will do it do you believe that God will do it? This is what is serious. God will do it. He might be late. Couldn't he have done it um, earlier? No, you need to be patient. You have to fight the good fight. Fight to enter through the narrow gate. God will give to you what he has promised. And it will be perfect. Don't go and take it on your own. And don't let the vultures to destroy it, because then God will, find, will come, but there won't be anything. But all day, Abraham protected it. And after the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham. He came in a trance because Abraham um, won't be able to see the presence of God. He fell asleep. And he was able to see with the spiritual eyes and to hear with the spiritual ears, not as a physical man, but as a spiritual man. And when he came in a trance, then behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Why? So that he may humble him. Because he is about to see something really great. And then the fear of God comes and the man is disappeared. And, and I repeat this, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Is everything that God did to Paul, he blinded him. This was complete humiliation. He came in a trance and he was humiliated as well, so that the man, um, Abram, would be able to, to face what God was about to do. And the Lord said to Abram, and Abram is listening to me, and he, he is terrified, and God tells him the things that will happen in the future. 
And he's saying all these things for us, for the others, for Isaac, for Jacob, for all those who were found in Egypt. Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, not in this land, because their land is the land of Canaan. Yet they will um, live in a land which is not theirs and there and will serve them and they will afflict them 400 years. We all know from the New Testament and uh, from the Old Testament that the people of Israel stayed in Egypt for 400 years. God is not wrong. He's saying this, that he will um, enslave them and afflict them. The years that Joseph was alive, there wasn't any kind of affliction. They had amazing time with uh, Pharaoh, but for 400 years they would be afflicted. But the nations in whom whom they will serve, I will judge. I will intervene. And when I will intervene, then they shall come out with great possessions. And, my beloved brethren, in our life, it is necessary that we may wait for God to intervene. Perhaps years may pass by and time may pass by, yet we are expecting for the intervention of God. Why? Because He loves us. Because He will not leave us nor abandon us till the end will come. God will intervene and he, either times He does it right away, either, uh, other times later and other times at the end, in the end. Now, you have to go through this 400 years, um, you have to go through this 400 years as a slave, which was when the depression will come, the affliction, then I will judge and I will bring these people out from them with many possessions. So now you shall go to your fathers in old and a good old age. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. And this is an amazing promise and we should and seek it that we may have a good old age that our end may be in peace blessed because the end will be so if our life is in Christ if we'll have to repent in the end then trials will come we should better repent now so that we may leave at a good old age. And it's not just that uh, we should leave 100 and more years. Um, I used to tell him that I will not, um, I'll not die because the Lord will come to take me. Of course, I was saying this not because that I have this kind of revelation, but we are waiting for the Lord. Either we live or we are dead. We are waiting for Him. We are waiting for the Lord to come and receive us and meet Him in heaven, in the heavens. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here in their land, and why am I so much delayed? Now, this is an amazing revelation that God gives us. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. The time to judge them hasn't come so that I may judge them and cast them away. So I am patient. The Lord is not delayed, as some consider this. 
yet he is long suffering toward us so that we may be ready and take part in the rapture of the church. And we said, when he said all these things, then the sun went down and it was dark and there was a smoking oven and the burning torch that passed between those pieces. And this was the covenant of God with Abram. As people used to go uh, from the midst of the uh, cut sacrifices and it was as if they were making a, sacri- uh, a covenant with God. Now we see God that passed through this sacrifice making a covenant with Abram. On the same day, the Lord, the word of God explains that the Lord made a covenant with Abram saying, Now this is the covenant. To your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, the Kenazites, and the Kedmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, and the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. And this was the covenant. And when God makes a covenant, this means that this will definitely happen. And no one can hinder it. It's another thing to a promise for which you might not be worthy or a calling that you are not worthy to walk this path but this is a covenant which means that no matter what will happen God will do it and God has made a covenant no matter what Jesus Christ will come to receive his church Amen